What's up, what's up, what's up, y'all? You are listening to the Data is My Science podcast, the show that makes data your passion with your host, Dapper Data. I am here, I'm back. Um, and and today I have a special, a very, very special guest on this podcast, all right? You know, I've talked about AI, unsupervised, supervised learning. I talk about uh, uh, a lot of different things, right? We talk about machine learning. We talk about, you know, how um, data is impacting every single person in the industry, in their industry, right? There's many industries out in the world and data is always impacting somebody, okay? Making all these different decisions in the world, is, it, can get, it can get pretty complicated if you're not using data to kind of back up your decision. Now, all right, so we're in the 2021 age. I mean, we're in the 2021 era, okay? And when we talk about the growth of data, it is growing like crazy, right? It's growing like wildflowers and it's not stopping. But one of the most important things that people do not discuss is the misinformation of data being distributed, all right? And so that's why I wanted to bring in this person today, all right? Because if you think about it, right, you have the detection and responsibility of generating some of this fake or misinformation data, right? It, it, it's not really talked about, okay? You think about realistic photos, the audio, the videos, we think about all those different things, forgery, uh, all those different things being generated um, in, in sort of in, in, in AI, right? In artificial intelligence technologies, uh, and I and I and I wanted to probably talk about maybe even social media, as you know, my background is social media, but there's misinformation even out there. I don't know how to detect it. Right. And and so I brought this person on a guest and I always do this. Right. We need an expert to talk about this field. OK, so I brought on Dr. Demir. All right. Say hi, everybody. Hello. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want to introduce Dr. Demir. Uh, I mean, this this woman is is an excellent, excellent data scientist, excellent researcher. She's done extensive research in the industry, focusing on generative um, models for digitizing the real world, deep fake detection uh, generation techniques, analysis and synthesis approaches in geospatial industry with machine learning, and much, much more. And so. If you if you really go out there and you do some research on Dr. Demer, she's almost touched a lot of different things, right? A lot of different things with the data science industry. But one thing that we're going to talk about today, okay, is understanding really the human behavior behind things when it comes down to deep fakes. All right, what deep fakes are, okay? So you get a great understanding of that, what that means, who is to blame for the misinformation of of the the that's that's being distributed right now. I think that's really important because I don't know who who who's the problem, right? I don't know how do you even find that. So we'll talk about that, you know, and then we'll dive into some AI ethics, all right, uh, to 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 close it out. But Dr. Demir, if you don't mind, just go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you for the great introduction to the talk mm -hmm. and to me. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have met you. Um, so, uh, I'm Ilke Demir, uh, I am a research scientist uh, looking at whatever I'm curious at. <laughs> so, um, it spans everything from like deepfakes as today's topic to geospatial machine learning to generative models like GANs or procedural models. So, it's basically a combination of like computer vision, machine learning and computer graphics. Mm -hmm. um, so. I have been um, working on these different topics in different domains. So I have done like some machine learning work in um, geospatial learning, in learning and maps. Um, on the other hand, I also did that uh, did like similar approaches in virtual reality, or like in Intel Studios. Uh, I have looked at like um, a 3D version of everything that we are digitizing, right? So how can we create like real life um, VR and AR movies with like so much data, like 270 gigabyte per second of data. Can we actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like just imagine there are like 100 cameras in a 10,000 square uh, feet dome and we are digitizing everything in, in inside. So just imagine like all the, like that's like the future of filmmaking, like uh, AI right. and filmmaking hand in hand. But yeah, we can talk about that later maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I, I did read about that, but, um, but I, I mean, just, just really uh, laying out um, how the process is going or every detail about it, you know, at a high level, like you just did, you know, I, that just, that's just kind of mind blowing to me. Right. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. To be able to do that, you know, so I want to jump right in, right. Deep fakes. Okay. I, I promise you, I didn't hear anything about deep fakes. I'm, I'm doing my doctorate as we talked about, right? And I probably didn't hear anything about deep fakes until later on in the in, in, in my doctoral uh, career or path, right? And, and even then, I really didn't hear too much about it, right? You know, and, and it's something that you almost have to know that data is everywhere. If you understand that data is everywhere and you understand that um, that misinformation is everywhere, right? I mean, even to a Wikipedia page, right? You just don't know whoever's putting this information in there. Who, you know, is it real? Is it not? You know, I mean, with COVID right now, I, I don't know. I didn't know what was, what was real, right? <laughs> you know, with COVID. And so uh, there's so much information that's being put out there and you have to know who to trust. But there's also, the, as data continues to pile on, pile on and stuff, looking at secondary data, right? I don't even know if the secondary data is real that I'm looking at sometime. And, and so from your perspective, could you explain to us what is deep fakes? Right. Sure. So deep fakes are um, facial videos, just like you see here, but we are not deep fakes. <laughs> we are. <laughs> <good>. <laughs> so videos like this where the actor uh, or the action of the actor is not real. So hmm. instead, for example, if you take this video of me talking and apply a defect generator, uh, generation method with Nicolas Cage uh, picture, so instead of me with my hair and my blues, uh, Nicolas Cage would be talking and like, oh, data is like this, defects are like that. <laughs> uh, um, it may be, um, so most of the defect approaches are one, one source and one target. So, for example, the actions and maybe the voice or um, the behavior comes from me as a source and the target is Nicolas Cage's photo or video where we reanimate him doing these, saying these, etc. Now this is, um, defects are mostly video, uh, but there are also like um, voice synthesis or like image-based defects. It doesn't need to be video, it can be images. And they, uh, the reason that they are called deep is because um, we have Photoshop for years right like you can like uh, try to like copy paste my fa my face or eyes or like do some blending and like there are very talented artists that can do that but those are all like very manual time consuming like you need to do all the details etc so with the um with the proliferation of deep learning approaches um especially GANs, like generative adversarial networks um mm. these deep fakes are blooming they are everywhere like uh, especially in um like in dark places um they are used even for like uh bad um uh, ac bad actions like bad bad things um and um it is coming like a like a it, it's bringing so many dystopian futures like uh, as if like um i'm telling you all of this but how do you believe i'm i am not a deep fake or um oh, yeah. i'm not as <laughs> as an important person but like uh you know the first uh, uh, examples of academic papers giving deepfakes were Obama saying something about their paper and Obama yeah. wouldn't know their paper, right? Yeah. Like they, 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 there is no, there's no possible way that like um, that paper has been explained by Obama, but it was a deepfake. So all of these, um, um, all of these examples are actually bringing all those like uh, bad scenarios about the future, about like the social erosion of trust, basically. Yeah, no, that, that that was a great explanation, and and I'm I mean a, after knowing that we were going to have this interview, I went and tried to dabble in, or I actually tried to look up some more information on deepfakes, right? Like where is it occurring and things like that, you know? And in the national security area, right? You know, with with some of those uh, those those groups of people, right? The intelligence community is occurring a lot, you know, or they're 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 starting to think about it more and more and uh fraud detection things like that you know they're starting to think about it more and more and i just didn't know that this was something that is is i i guess it's just something like we talked about in this and it's never talked about right you know it's not talked about amongst the common people who are not doing the research like that right now yeah. uh so 
when you think about deep fakes, right, where would you say that they occur the most? Um, actually, there are some studies around it, and very unfortunately, they occur um, mostly for pornographic content. So any like um, non-famous person used as the source and the target um, of a celebrity, like target photo or a video of some celebrity used to reanimate that. So you can find like many different celebrity uh, porn around the deep dark places of the web, which are all deep fakes. Um, uh -huh. And I think 96%, um, I, I don't want to misquote them, uh, but I think 96% of all the deep fakes are actually uh, pornographic content. The rest are like politicians, yeah, um, like other like for fun, etc. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. And 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 I guess that makes sense because we're talking about from a visual standpoint, they're kind of swapping the the actions that's occurring, right? But they're putting the face and yeah. uh, with with the person doing the action, but it's really not that person, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And they're trying to make it as realistic as possible, so you don't even realize that that body does not belong to that face so that's right. even like the um verse part i guess so are these deep fakes are they automated you know if not will they will that happen or, or do you believe that automated deep fakes are going to occur right with, with ai in place? yeah um actually um there are some um probably illegal services out there that you upload a an image and you upload the source and target that we talk about and the defect is got, it is done um in the recent news though there was even a worse um automation of defects which was hmm. that there was a signal bot um you know you know signal the the app hmm. um there was a bot on signal and uh you just like uh send payment and send the um photo of anyone you want and the photo the the person in the photo is uh nudified so you get the nude version of that yeah um and that is a, a type of deep fake that you actually change the clothed body with unclothed body um which is the learned representation of the of of, of a human body in the um image domain in the pixel domain um so when I say technically, it doesn't sound it, it doesn't mm -hmm. sound as bad, uh, but like more than six hundred thousand women have been nudified by that bot. Can oh you believe? That? Yeah, yeah. They don't even know that. It's just like just imagine there is a, a photo of a female on the web. You send it, and it it comes back nude. Done. But it's not it's not their actual bodies that they're doing it right. It's just that they're putting a body to the face. Right, right, okay. right. Yeah. But they are modifying the, the actual photo to be nude. So it's not their body, but it is as realistic as their body. So how can you even claim right. that that's not my body, right? Right, right, right. And I mean, so if we can't, you know, believe our own eyes, right? How can we really catch those deep fakes, right? How, how do you... How do you trace? I mean, this is probably one of the you might you might give away the sweet sauce, the secret sauce right now, right? How do you trace back deep fakes? That, that is the wonderful question. That is my research, my current topic, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, there, are, uh, it's not just me working on this domain. There have been some approaches trying to detect the deep fakes. And what they are doing is um, like, um, as if they are training those deep models to generate, they are training models to detect. But the more they train them, the generators are getting more clever, more photorealistic, they can find those artifacts. So instead of looking at the fakery of those videos, uh, we thought that can we actually find some authenticity signatures in humans in our own videos so that mm -hmm. that that is like a watermark for all the humanity, right? And we actually find some uh, biological priors that uh, that shows our authenticity. So one of the uh, most common ones is uh, our heart rate. So yeah. you don't see, we don't see, uh, it's not visible to the eye, but even in this video, there is the PPG signals 
that shows my heart rate on my face. So, oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because because my, my, my blood is pumped uh, through my veins, my veins are changing color. And that is computationally visible. That is like very subtle, not visible to the eye, but that is computationally visible. And that's called PPG signals. So mm -hmm. we are actually using those PPG signals to, act to find whether something is fake or not. Because deep fakes do not preserve the PPG signals at all. Um, if you, so our heart rate is like this, right? Like a sinusoidal. Right, right. Um, but deep fakes heart rate is everywhere. It's like, mm, there is no real, real like a periodicity. The, if you look at the spectrogram of that signal, you don't see any like uh, consistent spectrums. So mm. we extract those PPG maps from the videos to detect whether they are uh, fake or not. Mm. Oh no! And that is called fake catcher. Oh, I, 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 I oh, forgot like the name. So yeah, um, <laughs> my approach is called fake catcher. Oh my goodness! I have to write that down. Let me write that down. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> now that's that's exciting, you know. Um, oh man! So so all right, you have we're talking about deep fakes, and we've been talking about deep fakes from a. I feel like it's only been the negative point of view, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is are all deep fakes bad, right? Or 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 are there deep fakes that can actually benefit us in the future? Yeah, of course they are not all bad, and of course um, all the research community, like computer vision community, is not bad people trying to find <laughs> different methods to generate those bad videos. Um, it actually started with all the. Um, AR and augmented and virtual reality applications. So everyone wants their digital to win. I like uh, if 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 I go to a VR game or I don't know like Second Life, and if you see me like this in that virtual platform, you would say, "Wow, like this is like really realistic," and you can maybe choose to live in that world, right? Mm -hmm. So it all started with this. Um, and instead of um, just um, like reconstructing from lots of data and lots of images, etc. Trying to find a representation that can uh, span all the population in a way that can generate deep fakes is actually the base problem that the research community is trying to solve. Um, so, for example, like maybe very simple example um, in 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 the studio in Intel Studios when we are trying to create those AR movies, um, COVID happened, right? And uh, we already shoot like uh, a couple of episodes uh, for an AR uh, series. Uh, but the uh, actual um, person that presents the, uh, the series couldn't come to the studio for the next next chapter uh, because of the COVID. So what we do is <laughs> we actually use the previous da um, data that we have for him and make her, him record uh, his 2D version, like a video. Then mm -hmm. we created a deepfake of that person for the next chapter. So he doesn't need to come to the studio for the 3D capture. We can just create a 3D deepfake of that person from the 2D video of him. So that's something positive, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. No, that is positive. That's just the way the world is going, right? Taking advantage of the technology from a positive standpoint. Um, yeah, that's amazing because I, I mean, honestly, throughout this time, right, up until this time, I have been thinking that deepfakes were bad, all bad. <laughs> it seems like majority of them. But, you know, maybe a lot of them are bad, you know, but I guess there are some positive ones that never get talked about. Uh, but but the bad ones are the ones that are getting talked about because we're trying to uh, to stop them a lot yeah. more. Right? Yeah. Um, so, OK, so how are these deep fakes really impacting people? Right. When it comes to it. And I ask that because. I was re I was researching a little bit about this before our interview about deep fakes and exhaustion of like critical thinking, right? Came came to mind, you know, and 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 it seems like it takes more effort for individuals to really ascertain whether information is true or not. So you're just exhausted, right, from <laughs> from trying to figure this out. I mean, you're doing research. I don't know how long. How long have you been doing research on um, deep fakes so far? Um, I guess I started 2017 or 18, something like that. So like three years. So even the from a research standpoint, you know, it could probably get exhausting. Right? You can go and take yourself down this rabbit hole where you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, and your mind is blown. But then you have people out there that's trying to that's that's not in the research. It's not 
that have have not um, done any type of data science work, that have not dabbled in any of the field of research that you are doing, and they're they're starting to understand this, right? You got the, um, the those trusted actors, right? The New York Times and things like that too. They're mm -hmm. sitting there, and you're thinking, man. It's, it seemed like it could be exhausting. Is that an impact that you see happening more and more? Is that is that one of the people that you see impacted by this? Yeah, of course, of course. People like um, with this rate of explosion of defects, people will just like not trust even the truth. Um, they will say, that, "Oh, yeah, this is probably a yet another defect." I will just like um, uh, close this and. Um, like it even affects the interpersonal relationships. So maybe your cousin is sharing something that you trust your cousin. He would never get uh, tricked by those things and you believe what he shares and he said, oh, sorry, that was defect. So then then how like you, you, you the, that, that is actually the, the definition of social erosion of trust, right? Like the, the um, trust to companies, trust to organizations, trust to individuals, because those uh, defects and misinformation can like, fall through all the cracks then that that uh, the concept of, of trust is changing but on the other hand there are of course like the like the um platforms that for detection of deep fakes like detection of misinformation uh we know that like some of our uh, approaches are being used by like uh those like big media companies like new york times or like other other um um big uh, new online news um, um uh, platforms um, and um, there are also like big tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, etc. They have many research and product uh, uh, solutions for defects and misinformation. But these are all taking time for implementation and actually being accurate enough to uh, disentangle what is true and what is not because they are very realistic. Um, they are very believable. Um, and maybe one of the things that uh, is relevant to your uh, area is that instead of looking the content itself, looking at the share paths of that information of or of that deep fake is also a very valuable signal. So um, is it like just shared by a couple of people or is it like mass shared with uh, that huge share graph with many bots? or where is the origin, what, what is the distribution pat pattern, what is the fan out in that graph, et cetera. So that is another way that you can actually uh, do some like social media um, spread analysis to mm. find the defect. Oh man, I might need to write that down uh, for my <laughs> dissertation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's great, great information. And so, um, you know, just, highlighting some of the things that you said, you know, and, and really looking into it, I I started thinking about like the movie Liar Liar a little bit or like liar, <laughs> just liar liar in general. And do you see that I feel like deep fakes are moving faster than we can keep up with? Do you do you see what I'm saying? Do, does that does that resonate with you? Do you feel like you'll ever be able to really catch up to the the speed that is going right now I mean, with artificial intelligence, machine learning, right? When we talk about machine learning, where it's training, right? You're training this model here and then you're constantly training it. Eventually, how can we even keep up with it, right? You know, with all this data here, do you see it being, uh, trying to really detect deep fakes being something that we'll never really be able to uh, grab or or figure out or be able to solve all the hard problems that are happening right now? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So it's always an arms race, right? Like um, detection better than generation better than detection better and whatever detection is using as the clues, generation is taking and learning on it. So mm -hmm. that actually was an attempt to break that chamber because the PPG maps that we are um, using are not really um, differentiable in the sense that you cannot put it into the discriminator of a generator and learn them right mm -hmm. so if you cannot really learn them then maybe that is a good prior that's a good signal that we can trust another um another let's say step that we took towards like finding uh like making it harder to find the defects is instead of deciding whether something is real or not let's try to find the generator that generated them so mm. Yeah, 
So those PPG signals that I talked about, um, they actually uh, contain the residue of the generator, of the GAN that generated that content. And we can actually project that residue to the biological domain so that we can classify which GAN it comes from. So given any video, I can say that, okay, this is created by face-to-face. Um, -face. Uh, another video, this is created by neural textures. This is created by XYZ Z, Z GAN. Um, mm -hmm. so if we can actually collect all of those source GANs, we can actually trace back the defects. And whenever there's a new GAN, new generator that we don't know about, we can actually build better detection me methods that is specific for that GAN. So when we do that source separation, source tracking, uh, we are better armed for that specific generator and we can actually like have uh, a little bit stronger um, stronger uh, ammunition towards towards all of those uh, defect methods. All right. Well, uh, I mean, you. I hope everybody here is really recording this and really <laughs> taking notes because I know I am. You know, and and you just you have so many questions going through my head right now. Right. I don't even know what to to ask next. But uh, one thing I thought about was you you were you talk a lot about the visual aspect of things, right? The video imagery. Um, you know, uh, maybe I think you even touched on the audio. I think you did. Yeah, you touched on the audio part, but um, not so much the textual part, right? And and I, and I when reading it, I was thinking, okay, well, my thought was information was probably out there more from a textual standpoint, or data is more from textual than you see more of the videos and things like that. I mean, and it seems like I don't know which one is harder, right, to detect or not, but textual seemed like it was um it was something that might be a little bit more difficult in my eyes but but you may have better insight on that do you see textual deep fakes uh happening more often or have to, has that been something that has been happening for years yeah. um so text-based misinformation um uh, is actually in a way um harder to detect because you need to know the context, you need to know the date, you need to know who is saying it, with what motivation, with what agenda, etc. But as these reasons are known by the people more, people trust less as textual misinformation because they they what they, they the threshold for people to believe what they read is much less than the threshold to believe what they see. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the misinformation uh, for textual information is more um, towards catching the mass of it. So if mm -hmm. that is like distributed, that, that news is distributed like over millions of outlets, etc. Then maybe that is a way that to like uh, find okay, like this is important information that is reaching out so many people. So maybe from that so many people, some portion of it will believe it. Versus when a deepfake uh, reaches to some people, almost most of those people will believe it because they see it. They say like, okay, like this is realistic. Like, look at his eye. <laughs> you know. Um, the, so that is that is even like worse. So um, maybe it will be balanced in future because the more deepfakes are out, the more people will, the less people will believe in them. So the textual information will have the same importance of, have the same threshold of believability with the deepfakes, uh, but it's not the case right now. So that's why like detection methods are more complex or uh, more towards like uh, finding visual deepfakes or audio deepfakes. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about it that way, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I, now that you broke it down, even looking at social media, right? Uh, a lot of people, when they when they do, if I look at the engagements that occur, the shares, the saves that occur, right? That type of data that occurs is really, um, and this kind of proves your point that when people are doing videos, they get more saves, they get more shares, right? It's, it's something about the emotional connection that you see with somebody that, and you believe them when they're actually talking about it, right? Because you can feel that they're confident, things like that. But then when there's it's so much information out there where people have opinions and they just write out their opinion, right? And from a text-based standpoint, I don't know what's fake, what's real. I, I, I'm more likely to believe somebody talking to me on a YouTube video and telling me how to do something than to 
than than to actually write it out, right? Yeah. And so, oh man, that yeah, yeah, you had me thinking about a lot of that stuff just then. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right, so we talked about deep fakes, right? And I think there's a strong connection. We talked about it before between deep fakes and AI ethics. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So I really want to dive into that before we end because uh, uh, people want to know a lot about AI. As a matter of fact, I had somebody on here who was a doctor recently who talked about AI ethics, more from a religious standpoint of things and how it's impacting different uh, communities, minorities, right, as well. And, and so it was an interesting conversation that we had. And my question would be, should AI be used to replace people, right, in positions that require respect and care, right? When you think about those things, from an ethical standpoint, um, your thoughts on that, right? You know, think about customer service, uh, therapists, soldiers, uh, police officers out there that are in care. You know, do you think AI really kind of have uh, uh, AI ethics plays a big role in that, or do you think that? Um, that it would actually, AI would actually replace these people over time? I would say um, the time that you ask this question changes everything. If you ask this question now versus in maybe 100 years, it will be completely different. Because mm -hmm. um, all those AI approaches that we build are based on data, right? And data has its properties. Data is very like humans. Data has bias. Data has anomalies. Data is sometimes not transparent. Data is sometimes not free. Data mm -hmm. is sometimes biased uh, towards um, giving more power to some specific people or discriminating some people with specific properties. Um, so all of these AI approaches that we build on that data will carry out the uh, all of those things in the distribution to the actual system. So I will reword your question. Uh, your question was like, should we uh, uh, swap uh, uh, people with AI? So I will ask your question as, should we swap those people with um, systems that may have um, bias and not transparent behavior mm. Mm. i would say no no don't do that right, <laughs> we, <All> right. <laughs> because like whatever we are we are doing that like but whatever we are uh, um, uh whatever system that we are using it should be fair to everyone it should be deterministic it should be um free of bias it should not like for example if i have a data set of uh, um, one million face images but only like um 10 of them are female or only like 10 of them are, are um, uh, non-white people then you will be neglecting all of these people that are left out of the system and although this system is um uh, is the technical system that we are talking about. Uh, when this technical system is swapped with people in power or people uh, with responsibilities or people with, uh, with, with tasks that are changing other people's life, then you are actually creating a social system, not a technical system, based on the um, improper data that your samples carry through the system. So um, I think that goes like to the to the core of AI ethics. Why even we need AI ethics? Because we need all that, all that like interpretable systems, all those fair systems, all those transparent systems. And the data and the system and the algorithms should be um, should be studied, should be examined, should be inspected so much that none of these negative side effects or unknown side effects are carried from the data through the system to affect right. people. Right, now that's a great point. And, and I think that if you really think about what AI does, right, and you let it get a hold of something like the deep fakes, right, that's out there. Um, and you already talked about some of those bad stories, right, you know, the bad uh, things that can happen. Um, and I can only see it getting worse if you don't have regulations in place or you don't have some type of standards or something like that or 
betting, right? You know, are there are there currently any regulations in place for AI uh, ethics? That, yeah, that would- oh, that, that's a great question. So um, there are some um, there are some um, regulations that were proposed. Uh, I'm not sure about the current status of them, but mm-hmm. one very interesting conversation that we had with one of the uh, uh, one of the people in law, like studying law, um, um, studying like such effects of defects in law, is that um, um, like not the actual content, but the creation of the content should also be uh, taken under observation. For example, um, you know, like um, whether defect or not, uh, sorry, um, like in general, like child pornography is illegal, right? Mm-hmm. Is it still illegal if it is defect? It is because the CG pornography of child children is not illegal, but defect is not CG, but it is not real. So how do you do that transition? And if you like go to the to the uh, heart of it to create that um, generator to cre- create that defect, you need to train so much on real data. So the person that is creating it has the real data. So that is illegal. Right. Okay, but that's we are on the same page. Right, but right. after the system is created, um, after the generator, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> like, um, if I am like just use just 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 watching the product of that system, which mm-hmm. is not real, am I still in trouble? So these yeah. are all the problems that they are trying to find like um, some some ground because like. Synthetic data is not the problem. Synthetic data has been there for for so long, but right. synthetic data was always like completely uh, decoupled from real data. Now that they are so intertwined that you actually need that real data to be as realistic to create that synthetic data as realistic. So um, there are a couple of uh, uh, legislations that actually uh, was proposed. Um, I think it, the first one was in two thousand nineteen, and I remember a recent one. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, whether they passed or they are still there. So sorry about that. I should have done my homework. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was uh, no, that was great. You know, because I, I'm sure that's something that we can all take back and start to really research and understand. You know, because uh, I even look at like autonomous vehicles, right? You know, they get in an accident. Who in the world is to blame? Is it eventually right because the decision? Is it really? It's not the. It's not us making the decision, right? So. As a human being, right? It's, it's a, at some point, the more you're using data that's being trained and trained and trained, and then decisions are made based off of that, right? By the machine, at what point, who takes ownership of what when you get into that, right? Who's the one that gets put in the handcuffs for the child pornography? I don't know, right? It's because now you're saying, okay, is it this machine that, or is it this human who didn't say, hey, like, I'm gonna seek this out specifically you know, they just said, hey, I'm training data, I'm training you to do this. And the next thing you know, it just goes sporadic and does its own thing. You know, I don't know who I would handcuff. You know, who would you handcuff? Would you handcuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you handcuff the machine or would you handcuff the uh, the human? You know, <laughs> if you if you think about it, like, um, can you actually um find the gun manufacturer for manufacturing a gun if the gun kills someone, right? But right. when you manufacture a gun, you are not actually using many dead people, right, to to train that gun. <laughs> so yeah. there is already something very bad going on and the system is learning from it to, uh, to mimic that. So I don't know, uh, like just don't touch the researcher. That's it. <laughs> Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, the, the crazy thing is, you know, when the more and more I think about it, it, it actually becomes a little bit intimidating, a little bit scary, right? Because you think about um, how you cannot point the blame to somebody. Right now, we know who to point the blame to, right? You know, in the military, we're talking about autonomous, like weapons, right? We're thinking about weapons um, and machines. Like, man, who, who really was a, the one that decided to kill this person on the other side, right, or something, you know, and and so that's a scary thought, right, in my eyes, because um, because you need to hold somebody accountable for the actions that occur, if especially if it goes sporadic and it does the wrong thing, right, you know, 
Um, man, oh my goodness, you know that it just has me thinking about some of that stuff, you know, a lot more, you know. Um, and I even think about like from an empathy standpoint, you know, we we require feelings and of empathy, you know, from a human being, but when we allow the machine to kind of take control over things, you know, can they feel the same way we feel? You know, uh, machines replacing people will probably make us frustrated and alienated and devalued and things like that when it comes down to it. Um, but no, 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 thank you for this. Um, and like right. maybe one last thing, like um, even if there's a system that can learn empathy, who is empathy is carrying on or who right. feels empathy? Right. So empathetic. So like all of these um, human positive and negative sides, are they carried over? Are they carried over fairly? Like these are very, very um, human questions that we should answer before actually trusting those machines to mimic anything that we are doing. No, no, no. Great point. Great point. You know, so as everybody knows, I like to end with sort of some type of dope data nugget or a gem at the end of it. And I just want to thank you for being on this podcast, you know, but uh, deep fakes are real, right? You know, it's a real thing. People should start to pay more attention to it. And they probably could, uh, the more they pay attention to it, the more they can be aware of what's going on. And uh, the fake news is out there, fake images is out there, fake videos that are out there. Um, the researchers are doing their job, as Dr. Demir is showing, right? They're, they're actually, <laughs> they're, they're honing in on it. They're really trying to figure this thing out. Um, and, 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 and this is important, right? Is it spread across places like social media, from my standpoint, um, uh, you're thinking about national security, right? You know, fraudulent things, you know, they're, they're all over the place, you know, but uh, is there anything that you want to be able to tell the audience out there about Deep fakes, AI ethics, or whatever it is that that that, that you think that, that would be viable to everybody. Um, maybe I can um, talk about one thing that we thought would be some responsible way of doing deep fakes. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the harms of these deep fakes are coming because there is this target and source relation, right? You are trying to mimic, you are trying to impersonate someone. Um, so in our latest research work, what we did is, um, what if we try to ensure that the defect is not one person that we try to impersonate, try, try to like uh, mimic. So we actually built a multi-source defect platform. So uh, you say like, uh, you select and you say, I don't know, like uh, I want the eyes of Johnny Depp. I want to, uh, I don't know, like, uh, cheeks of Dapper Data. I want the nose of Ilke Demir. Um, mm. And then the defect is actually a combination of those people, which is still photorealistic, which like those parts looks like those other people, those people that you selected. But at the end of the day, it's responsible of doing defects because it doesn't mimic that completely mimic someone. So if I use that in a I don't know, uh, in an AR show, no one will get hurt or no, no one will get like offended because that person doesn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one way that I can see that like deepfakes can, can be responsible somehow. Yeah. Um, and it also provides mix and match. So the, the name of the paper, the paper is not out there yet right now, but the name of the paper is like Men of Your Dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because it's like, you can like mix and yeah. match all of those different parts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it will be uh, out soon, like on archive or, or it will be published. So yeah, that would be great, you know. And that that just got me thinking about how I wonder if there's some correlation or will be some correlation between deep fakes, right, from an imagery, video, photo uh, standpoint, and um, maybe altering your body physically in real life, right? You know, maybe figuring out well if if when the more they see people that are not really real, right? Because you're, 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 you're putting together fake stuff, right? <laughs> you know, uh, with the images, but then people are starting to say, man, I want to be like that more, or I want to, you know, have that face. I want to have those eyes. I want to have those lips, you know, but really it's not, they're not real, right? You know, yeah. just put together to make them seem real. And then now me as a person who has a certain mindset that says, man, I want to look like that and alter my body. If it, I wonder if it would impact people in the future you know, from that, from that standpoint. You know. Yeah, right. Um, that is like a 
nice preview of <laughs> uh, what the scenarios, right? And there is also actually some uh, deep fakes that are um, continuously changing your age, for example, like what would I look like in 10 years or uh, what was this person's childhood look like? Or um, with like, for example, with our approach, you can just like mix and match your whole face with uh, the nose of someone that you like and they see that, oh, see, yeah, if I just like go to some surgery, I can look like this. Right, or, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah. One, one may be a good use case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be interesting, definitely in the future, you know, to see how that goes, you know. But all right, so we've talked a lot about all the serious, cool stuff, right? Serious, cool stuff, great things, um, deep fakes, AI ethics. Now it's time for the fun stuff, all right? Yeah. So, so I typically end the podcast, as my audience knows, with what I call overrated, underrated. I actually got this from a motivational speaker that I follow, um, and he does this cool thing on Instagram and other social media uh, uh, um, platforms where he talks about overrated, unrated. And basically what happens is I give you a statement, a phrase, a word, or something like that, and you get to choose, Dr. Demir, if it's overrated or underrated in your eyes, okay? From your point of view, you can explain why, why not if you want to, or you can just say, that's just my point of view, right? All right, you ready? Yes. All right, number one, ice cream. Underrated. Underrated. You love yes. ice cream? I do. And I love ice with cream. With all the variety <laughs> and all the things that you can do with it, I mean, it needs more attention. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. You know, I mean, my favorite, I think I've talked about this before, is like butter pecan ice cream. You know, I could talk about ice cream for days. I can wake up in the middle of the night and just get some ice cream, you know, it's something that just soothes my soul, you know, so I agree with you. All right. Next one. Television. Overrated. Overrated. Okay. okay. Yeah. I don't have television in my house for the past 10 years, maybe more. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you have time for it, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Uh, it is so ready information, you know, like you don't, you can, it, sometimes it doesn't leave space for your imagination. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes just like maybe reading a book actually makes your mind work more because you are like creating that world in your mind and watching it at the same time instead of just someone else creating that world when you watch it, right? So. No, yeah. great point. Great point. Great point. Yeah. All right. Scary movies. Overrated. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Like a good scary movie? Um, I don't know. Like, sure, I got scared and then what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get scared enough? I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right. Shopping. Overrated. I think so too. I hate you it. You don't need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe this is extreme, but I, I, I have clothes that I have been wearing for 15 years. I am mm -hmm. so okay, and they look new if you take care of them. And like, why do I even need need like, yeah? Right, right. There's this thing. Um, I think Obama, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, I think even Steve Jobs during this time here on this earth, uh, they would they would um, what is the name of that thing? Uh, basically, where you're you are you are constantly trying to decide on something. And they eliminated that by wearing the same thing all the time, right? Mark Zuckerberg literally wears like a blue shirt, blue jeans, something like that, all the time, right? Because he feels like he's uh, he's not trying to do too much, right? He does, he doesn't want to have to think about an outfit, right? He has so much going on in his life. Who cares, right? That's his thing. The same thing with Obama. He has a blue suit and a black suit. That's it, right? I mean, that's what he does. Um, and it's, it's amazing how the most successful people in this world, they take something like that, that people value so much, right? And then they decide to make um, make it something that they don't have to think about, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> um, maybe this is um, 
yeah, just keep this with your nose. No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> uh, so like you know, like uh, like every every everywhere. Like I got vaccinated. Everywhere is getting open, etc. And social dancing is opening. So um, I actually dance like salsa, bachata, etc. And um, like I used to teach. I used to like uh, perform, choreograph, etc. But like um, nowadays, it's like oh yeah, like COVID is ending. Let's go dance. And I have uh, one um, tight that I wear. And I actually have two two of them, but it is the same type. And like mm -hmm. for the past one month, I guess I'm wearing that to every dance event. It's right. I don't need to think about like, mm -hmm. and I don't care if people see me with the same thing because they they should be like um, interacting with my dance, not with my with what I wear. So I yeah. wear the same type to all the dance events, and uh, maybe that uh, actually eases people to like pinpoint me. Oh, that's the, that's the girl that dances like this, like you know, because right. they see the same visual cue everywhere. So anyway. yeah, yeah. So Definitely positive to come out. As a matter of fact, I, I remember what the name of it is it's called decision, decision fatigue. You know, you do not want to put yourself in a position where you're overwhelmed and you're constantly thinking about something where you can just make it very simple for you. Right. You know, white shirt, dress pants. If you have to go to work every day and wear dress clothes, just get five, five white shirts and then some dress pants and then you call it a day. Just go in. Right. They should be more. They should care more about the work you're doing, not necessarily the outfit that you have on, right? Yeah. All right, so let me see, I said ice cream, I said social media. Ooh, that's, uh, hmm. <laughs> I don't know, I think to, to be safe, I should mm -hmm. say underrated. Mm -hmm. Well, you can say it's right where it needs to be, maybe. It doesn't have to be overrated. <laughs> yeah, right where it needs to be. I, uh, assuming that all of our audience, like not all, but like some of our audience actually found us through social media. So right. I think we knew it. So <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. where it should be. Right. I say that is right where it needs to be. I do see how it can be overrated. I see how it can be underrated, right? Uh, sometimes I go down this crazy rabbit hole once I start looking at one thing that I, it takes time away from me, right? You know, that's actually how I started to, when I started a business in data science, I decided to focus in on social media analytics because so many people waste time, right? As a business owner, trying to, um, do marketing campaigns and things like that. When if you really if you're really using the data, you can find your target audience, right? You can find the demographics that you that you really want. You know, whether you're looking for somebody that is a certain age group, a certain gender, you know, you can you can really focus in on that by using the data. And um, I think that it can be a waste of time when you start to, from a business standpoint, start to be able to kind of uh, figure. You're trying to figure things out, right? Where the data is actually showing you everything. Right? I always say the data is like your most loyal employee <laughs> all the time, you know, it actually will help guide you um, places. All right, okay, so we've talked about the overrated, underrated, that's it, all right? But there was one cool thing that I thought that you did, right? And and we talked about this a little earlier. Okay, I asked you, what was your drink of choice, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a fun fact that you brought up to me that I thought was really cool. And you said, you make up and name personal cocktails whenever you are at a bar, right? And so I thought that was really cool. How did you start to do that? I mean, what made you say, I want to start naming every time <laughs> every time I go to the bar? Yeah, no, I actually, um, so I, I always like, we um, used to like uh, making my own cocktails. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think um, like, um, during my PhD, I think it was my birthday and uh, people were like drinking and um, actually eh, all, like most of my friends brought some other exotic uh, liquor and mm -hmm. I'm like, I have all of those things so I can like test and experiment with many things, you know, the researcher in, in heart. Uh, I can experiment with many things, etc. And um, I, I, I started to uh, relate the personalities or like some aspects of people with some liquors or ingredients that I like. So uh, in that, in that, uh, I, I uh, vividly remember that in that in uh, birthday part, birthday uh, celebration of mine, I have a very dear friend um, of mine, Xenia. Um, so she's like really, really like my one of my best friends. Anyway, um, so she's Russian. Um, and she is like, 
I don't want to uh, explain her personality, but um, I made a, a drink for her called Blue Russian. You mm -hmm. probably know like White Russian, etc. But I had some like very um, niche ingredient like blue croissant with some like uh, rum chata with some like orange zest and like, but it actually brings like the soft and like uh, cold, but still like in the heart, still like uh, sweet part of her. So I started to do that. And um, I, I still do it whenever I, I have friends over like, um, they like do some or whenever even like i'm angry with someone i make them a drink and <laughs> drink it they understand what's happening they, they know like they're like oh, is there um too much bourbon in this maybe mm -hmm. um i don't know whether bourbon may be too much but that's another yeah so yeah no that's 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 really cool that's really cool you know so all right. Okay. So we're ending the podcast. As usual, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Data is My Science podcast, the show that makes data your passion. I'm your host, Dapper Data. Where can they find you at or reach you at, Dr. Demir? Yes. Uh, um, they can go to ekdemir, I L K E D E M I R dot github dot io. That's my website. All the information is there. But um, if they are interested in deepfakes or generative models or um, future of filmmaking, like AI and filmmaking, um, they can actually request uh, speaking. Uh, engagements they can request talks from acm so if you search my name and acm you will see my uh, acm speaker profile and all the acm chapters and universities and research in institutions can request a lecture uh from me in those areas uh from acm um, that being said um if you are even like more curious about defects with more technical details um, next week in Woman in Technology Online Festival on June 10th at 12, 12 p.m. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm sorry, I should have written this down. Um, I will be giving a talk on deepfake dystopia and how can we evade this deepfake dystopia. So it will be a more detailed uh, talk about like the detection approaches, the source tracking, uh, more biological priors like gaze information, for example. Like, can I uh, look at your eyes and understand whether we are fake or not, right? Um, so all of this information, uh, all of this uh, will be included in my talk, uh, July 10th, uh, June 10th. Uh, next week, I guess, um, in Women in Technology Online Festival. Um, and um, it is like, uh, like even if you don't go there for me, I learned that uh, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama will be there uh, to give a keynote. Oh, yes. So that is like, I am like, oh my God, we are in the same. No. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. I support you. I support you. You'll do great. You'll do great. <laughs> But I can so, only imagine, right, how, <laughs> how your heart is racing on that one. I know, I know. It's like, ah. Yeah. We're excited. Look, look at my PPG signals. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the pulses, the pulses right now through, through your answers. <laughs> no, no, no. I've, I've learned so much from you, Dr. Mary. I, I really appreciate you being on this podcast. You know, everybody, you can always reach me at Mr. Dapper Data. That's at m-r-d-a-p-p-e-r-d-a-t-a -P -P -E on any one of the social media platforms my link is in the bio and it'll send you directly to the podcast and send you directly to the other locations and send you directly to be able to subscribe to anything like my youtube videos as well uh, also go out and you can purchase my book it's uh, www.mrdapperdata.com forward slash dapper book that's d-a-p-p-e-r book and i talk about how to increase um in, increase profits and increase followers and things like that with social media analytics right um and oh my goodness i mean we have to definitely get you back on the podcast dr Demero, or somehow and please please definitely i've seen her speak on youtube i mean she can really do her thing all right so make sure that you go on youtube you can check her out and definitely hire her. bring her in to speak because um, we need more people to be able to spread the word of deepfakes 
and how it's impacting the world, right? I mean, that's one of the ways we can probably catch up to the way that the data is, is going, right? The speed of it is going so fast, but to be able to catch up to it, we got to start spreading the word more and get people out there um, to, to really understand what's going on. So um, thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast, and I'll see everyone later. Thank you.